Hey folks, it's time for a new Metroidvania review, since I'll be tackling Bomb Services Minoria, a dark adventure with an emphasis on quick combat by the developer of the Momodora series. That said, was this experience a whole lot of fun, or was there none to be had? I'm your host Arlian, let's find out together. The battle between the Theocracy of Romilia and Witchkind have raged for many years, sparking several wars in the process. Led by the efforts of His Eminent Grace in the Sacred Office, they've done their best to suppress their heretical practices, and yet, they were ill-prepared for what followed. When the Old Queen died, her two daughters, Amelia and Poem Saliette, were left to vie for the throne, something which left the country reeling when Poem chose a third option, kidnapping her sibling and joining hands with the witches. In the ensuing confusion, they found their way into the very capital of the country, slaughtering their way to the heart of its castle, all so that they could initiate a grand ritual meant to put an end to the church's stranglehold. With no time to lose, the sacred office deployed countless nuns to suppress the insurrection, only for them to accrue boundless bloody losses. Their only hope rests with Sister Similla and Sister Fran, the last survivors of the slaughter. But their journey won't be easy, especially as the conflict's ugly truth comes to the surface. And synopsis aside, this game is rather dark. While the dynamic between Fran and Samilla is endearing, the setting itself is a crapsack world where you're essentially in indentured service to a fascist church, fighting in a brutal war against witches both willing and capable of butchering their way to the country's core. Which is to say, this is a fair bit more complicated than a simple heroic journey, and I loved every second of it. That said, it did take a bit of delving to get to the heart of things. See, the central narrative is a bit brisk, given it's contained rather neatly within a few dialogue sequences that play out at key junctures that are short enough they likely never will overstay their welcome. Beyond that, there's a few more obvious sources, like the dialogue you can have with a couple NPCs, as well as bits of narration Sister Fran provides during the journey through the castle. That said, you'll have to dig a bit deeper if you want to get more context for the setting and the bleakest bits of backstory. Mostly because it's contained within a combination of item descriptions and the lore documents you can find. While you will gather a number of these by progressing forward and beating bosses, quite a few are tucked away in the far corners of the capital, and honestly, I highly recommend hunting these down because they do a lot towards explaining the severity of the situation and the overall agenda of each side. It's just good, and really leans into the idea of gaining your own agency despite being a nun sent out on a seemingly suicidal mission. It also makes the game's climax feel a lot more impactful and provides that bit of nuance to everything that you might otherwise be missing. Though, speaking of impact, let's get into the nitty gritty of things, especially since I do have a lot of history with this developer's works. Specifically, as a veteran of Momodora Reverie Under the Moonlight, I wasn't sure what to expect, but it wasn't long before I picked up on a number of notable differences. First off, this game puts a larger focus on melee combat than its predecessor, which plays out in a few ways. The most obvious one is the way in which it literally limits your ranged options, as Similla's reliant upon incenses, spells with sparse charges which only replenish its save points. That said, it also provides you the tools you need in order to survive in close quarters. While the dodge roll is nothing new, you now have a parry which can clear out or heavily damage normal enemies or even stagger a boss if done repeatedly. Given that you can even trigger it in the air, you're afforded a number of options to create openings, and Samilla attacks quickly enough to exploit them. Admittedly, your initial attack string starts out with a fairly basic loop of slashes, but the game does provide you a number of avenues in order to up its overall complexity. The most obvious one is likely the interaction between the game's metroidvania elements and Samilla's swordplay. For instance, when you finally get a double jump ability, it comes in the form of an upward sword slash, which can be used to launch light enemies or evade an attack while chaining into an aerial combo against a larger foe. That said, there's also juicier options once you factor in the weapons you'll find over the course of the game. While these largely do the same damage as Samilla's initial weapon, Claremont notwithstanding, 
They all have quirks that set them apart, like the Morningstar dealing more stagger, the Ladle being a joke weapon, and the Brunhild, which has a different moveset. Now the reason this is interesting is because the sword's aerial attack is a sweeping strike that lifts you up but can't be spammed. That said, it resets after a double jump. Not only does this provide you some really dynamic combo options, it also has some fairly utilitarian applications for both platforming and even skirting past enemies, since you're granted an extremely flexible quad jump by the end of things. Only, well, I'll confess that I generally lean towards a simpler, more pragmatic style of combat, largely because of Minoria's overall lethality. Compared to Momodora Reverie, things start out substantially rougher, given that Sister Similla is shockingly fragile, to the point that normal enemies are more than capable of killing her in 2-3 hits at the start of the game, and will continue to do so if you're not careful. See, her strength is largely derived from leveling, rather than exploring the game for health upgrades like the Momodora games. While this does mean she can technically get much stronger earlier on, in practice it takes a fairly substantial amount of levels before you begin to see any notable changes to her stats. A trend which promptly inverts itself if you continue to grind since her later levels are weighted more insofar as stat increases than her earlier ones, to the point that Samilla's strength will begin snowballing with wild abandon, and the overkill system only feeds into this. See, if you deal twice an enemy's max health, you gain triple experience, which only plays more havoc then with her sense of scaling. Balance-wise, it can make the overall difficulty of the game feel a bit inconsistent, especially as you reach the latter half of the game. Nonetheless, I still found myself challenged largely due to the bosses. I relished each and every one of these encounters as they all provided their own distinct hurdles to overcome. Whether I was trying to figure out the full range of their skill sets or how they worked or simply how to contend with them, there was a lot to puzzle out for each encounter. And then again, when new phases would shake things up. In and of themselves, they make for a memorable test of skill, and that's without factoring in their hidden items because the hidden items are where the kid gloves comes off. See, while there's certainly a number of differences between this and Momodora Reverie, one element that carries over completely was the ability to earn hidden items associated with each boss by clearing their encounters without taking any damage. While this is an entirely optional challenge, it elevates each fight substantially and often ensures that you'll see the full gamut of their abilities even if you're overleveled, since face tanking and spamming your healing incenses is no longer an option. That said, if you do rise to the challenge, the rewards are worth it, because this is how you can find a fair number of Minoria's incenses and the Claremont weapon I talked about. Speaking of which, while I've glossed over incenses to this point, they do play a fairly large part in the latter half of your journey. As things progress, you'll be able to acquire an apothecary's worth of weaponized secret herbs and spices, ranging from diverse attack spells to buffs, as well as a broader array of restorative abilities. While some are lackluster or a bit finicky, there's some that are absolutely busted, like the storm ability that rains down swords and stunlocks enemies. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, since there's also passive variants. Whether it's increased attack, reduced damage, or need options like a chime that activates whenever you're near a secret, there's a wide range of options to choose from, and your only real limit being your inability to quit more than two at once. And I say only limit, given in practice you're able to pause the game and swap any of these around at your leisure. Which um, goes from being extremely convenient to becoming actively busted late game. For instance, if you've been collecting all of those active incenses, there's nothing stopping you anymore from just cycling through and expending all of their charges in order to partially melt a boss before swapping to buffs or restoration to just mop up the aftermath. Really, the only thing I think that stops you, beyond some sense of fair play, likely boils down to how diligently you've been exploring the map. Speaking of which, while Minoria is a metroidvania, it feels a bit more linear than the majority of its peers. That's not to say you're never given a reason to backtrack, but the segments you return to often feel shallow, boiling down to a room now accessible by a key, or a nook or ledge you hadn't been able to reach without an ability. It just feels a bit 
lackluster. Especially when you compare it to the world design at large, which made me feel fairly appreciative of the comprehensive shortcut system since it helped to mitigate the tedium. Even still, I went out of my way to find everything, both because of my fondness for the game's lore, but also because of how shops worked. See, while the various vendors you encounter require currency, it isn't earned from fighting monsters, but rather from a fixed number of coins scattered, and often hidden, around the map. If you want to add more options to your passive and active incense, it'll behoove you to explore every nook and cranny. Quite frequently, this design choice also means I'd highly recommend storing your coins early on and making sure you really want something before picking it up to avoid getting yourself locked into something and being unable to pick alternatives for quite some time. Still, this is essentially the game in a nutshell. Admittedly, I haven't talked a lot about the exploration abilities insofar as actually navigating the game, and part of that is simply because there aren't that many to go over. I'd already covered the more creative applications while talking shop about combat. Really, the only thing I failed to mention is that there's a bit of post-game content to fiddle with. First off, there's the Tower of Misery, which is essentially a series of high-level combat encounters which culminates in a bonus boss that serves as a fun nod to Momodora. And honestly, I'd highly recommend engaging with it if you were a fan of other encounters because it's a great boss fight. That said, the other element you can fiddle around with is New Game Plus mode. In this case, it can be largely considered a victory lap since you retain all of your items and levels, enabling you to easily collect anything you missed and to clear the other ending, since you're locked into whichever ending you choose. Yet it doesn't need to be a cakewalk. See, if you did finish the Tower of Misery, you unlock one last passive incense to buy. Frailty, which, uh makes you die in one hit, so this is largely for the people who still want a challenge. But yeah, that's the gameplay, so uh, let's get into the stylistic bits, and on the whole, I dug the visuals. In a certain sense, the game is weirdly cute insofar as its character design, and yet, despite that, it doesn't paint over its bleaker tones. Since it will more than happily have you walking through a corridor littered with dead nuns, including some legitimately pinned to walls with their own weapons. If anything, the macabre nature is made a bit more jarring because of how cute and endearing a number of the enemies look. Also, while the princess certainly has a lovely design, she, um, she also happens to be a walking poster child for Jiggle Physics. If that is an author appeal, I don't know what is. I'm, I'm getting off track here though, because what I haven't addressed yet is my favorite aesthetic element, the sound design. Specifically, the music. It wasn't just the fact that it did a great job of setting the tone for an area, which it does, or perfectly complementing a boss encounter and making sure that every one of its phases feel punchy. There were actually times, like when I reached the final region, where I found myself needing to pause just to listen to that theme. It's absolutely fabulous. But um, yeah. I've yammered a fair bit by this point, so let's wind things down, and ultimately, I really did enjoy my time with Minoria. Story-wise, it provides an interesting narrative to explore, which reaches a compelling conclusion, but still leaves me wanting to know more about the world. It's altogether well done. Mechanically, while I do thoroughly enjoy it, I do recognize that there's rough patches here and there. If you're expressly here to enjoy a metroidvania experience, there's definitely elements where it falls short, and yet I'd argue that I still found it to be a highly enjoyable game. Its early difficulty was an interesting challenge to navigate, and in my case, I thought the process of mastering its boss fights was fairly enticing. On the whole, it's fairly well crafted to the point I rate Minoria a hit. Minor flaws aside, I enjoyed the time I spent with it to the point I'm even more excited to dive into Bomb Service's next game, Momodora Moonlit Farewell. It also has me seriously considering doing a retrospective review of Momodora Reverie Under the Moonlight, which, if this video gets over 1k views and 100 likes, I'll add it to my list of things to do. But yeah, thanks for tuning in! Let me know your thoughts in a comment, if you enjoy indie reviews and dev interviews, hit subscribe and the bell. For a link to my Discord, the Crit Hit Cauldron, check the description. There's also a link to my Patreon if you want to see reviews early or want to support my channel like Green Witch Babby, Andy Noted, or Shrimp Mania. Also, I have neat swag like shirts and coffee at my merch house. That said, 
I'll catch you on the next episode of Crit Hit. Take care till then, folks.